This is Jacques Villeneuve, and you're listening to The Dirty Side of the Track. Hey now, welcome to The Dirty Side of the Track, America's leading Formula One podcast. I'm Brian, that's Rob. It's a very special edition this week. We're very happy you're here. Rob, tell everyone a little bit about what's coming next. Well, um, I mean, we've been quite quiet about it. We did mention it last week. We haven't <laughs> spammed every social media platform known to man, plus ones that man doesn't know about this week. Um, yeah, we've we've the bulk of today's show is when Brian and I sat down pseudo face to face with uh, Jacques Villeneuve, which we're so excited about. And we will try not to do, use up too much time at the beginning. We are going to hit a little bit of news and social that's gone on this week. Then we'll basically give because a few people requested this on. Uh, social media was kind of give a bit of a backstory of how on earth did two bozos uh, get Jacques Villeneuve on their show. Then we'll do the interview, which is we, we were lucky enough to kind of get 35 minutes with him. Uh, we'll then afterwards pull out our favorite parts, a quick French preview, and that will be that. And it's worth noting the interview will come to you unedited. So you will hear us making you know mistakes or asking questions or figuring it out but we didn't want to mess around with it because we wanted you to see how excited we were as two fans talking uh <laughs> listening with other fans uh of f1 it was just it was so fun it was so fun well we'll cover that later when we get into our in, uh, in the build-up this is, this is like um, this is like game day where you have all like that pre-match build-up so uh let's, right. let's... <laughs> right 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 so it has there has been some stuff going on this week even though there's no race this weekend uh, McLaren has tested out 77 new drivers as test drivers for next year. Um, it, it's, it was weird to me, if I'm just being honest. The best memes I saw about it on Twitter were those three-seater F1 cars, and they're like, McLaren's new car for next year. I mean, <laughs> they have Lando signed to a long-term deal, and Danny Rick is there next year. Danny Rick sees all this stuff come out, and he says, I'm not going anywhere in that papaya orange note he sent out. And, and, but they had... And help me out here, Rob. Like they had Colton Herta, Alex Pillow, and then then they had um, there was this whole deal with with Alex and Chip Ganassi going back and forth. And then Pato Award has tested multiple times for them. And then the rumors about Albon or Seb or Oscar Piastri. I mean, there's like, oh my God, is there anyone not associated to McLaren for t- I- for next year? I think I saw a tweet where both you and I were linked with the seat as well. I mean, it just got insane. And then um, there's that phrase, isn't there? The lady doth protest too much. Um, that Danny Rick tweet felt like, I don't know, to, you know, too much denying all the stuff is almost uh, an undertone of, yeah, it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I don't know what's going on there. But um, I mean, that is obviously um, a hot seat. Um, there's rumors about whether he's even going to see out next year, even though the contract's there. There was things flying around of, you know, yes, it'll get quite expensive to buy, for McLaren to buy Danny out of his seat and then whoever, if they were going after someone that's in an existing seat. I mean, to me, this is the tip of the iceberg, a silly season. Yeah, agreed. But I would, you know, I think they got to give Danny Rick time. Uh, what I, just a quick note, and we've discussed Ricardo a lot on here and what's been a bad year so far. And last year wasn't great, but he got better as the season went on last year. He won at Monza, right? I mean, that you don't accidentally win a race. And so that was later in the year, and it took him some time to get used to the car because he moved to McLaren from Renault. So now they're in a new car again, and it may not suit his driving style. The same way you actually can hear the conversation that the initial Red Bull suited Checo's driving style more than Max's. And Max is coming to grips with the car. He's still the world champion. He's still the points leader. But he could be getting better as he gets used to the car. So for me, maybe I'm just too nice and Johnny Optimist today. But I'd like to see Danny Rick have a little time in the car the rest of the year and, and see where he ends up before people make those decisions. Yeah, they, they always say there's no uh, smoke without fire. So I, I don't know. I'd like to think they let him see out his contract. And then if he absolutely kills it next year he, and gives them a real headache about what to do, then that'd be fantastic. But um, it looks like they're preparing for what to do once he's not there the year yeah. after next. So. Well, speaking of Aussies going other places, Michael Massey has left the FIA and went back to Australia. And uh, that's where he is now. So you can't can't think about bringing Massey back as a race director anytime soon. Um, not that anyone was thinking that, but a lot of people on Twitter like to make that joke. It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and bringing, talking to bringing things back after a very long exile, looks like South Africa is going to be back on the calendar. However, 
you quoted this from uh, a tweet that one um, a user that both of us follow, Engine Mode Eleven, great guy. But I think on that same um, thread, someone came back and said, "This is a recycled story. It's a hoax. It hasn't actually been signed." Do we know if it's actually been signed now, or have we just fallen for the it, same tweet? It definitely hasn't been announced if it's been signed. The only part is that DHL will be shipping freight there for uh, for Formula One. So. I don't think it's been confirmed, but here's the thing. I did spend, I went down the rabbit hole a little. There are 20 races that already have a spot on the calendar next year. There are five or so that are not on the calendar. And one of them is Spa, and it freaked me out. Freaked me out. Spa's got to come back. If Spa goes away, I will need intensive help from all my friends. But um, what I'll do this week is maybe Rob, if it's all right, could I do a blog this week and kind of look at Ooh. the contract status of the tracks and kind of see what's where and what's up for grabs and what we know and uh, maybe a short topic for next week. You go for it. All right, my first ever blog. It's gonna Woo-hoo. be a, it's gonna be a disaster. <laughs> okay, talking of uh, well, not really uh, disasters. Um, it's talking of things that make you sad, which is the thought of Brian making a, uh, yeah, a blog watching, makes me sad, letting yeah, him be in front exactly. of the keyboard, was that there was an uh, interview with uh, Mick Schumacher, and if nothing brings a tear to your eye, then this has to bring a tear to your eye, which was him Mick saying that he'd give up everything right now just to be able to talk to his dad about motorsport. I was like, oh. I mean, we all know that he's part of the Schumacher family, and I, I would, I, I'd send something out um, on social to sort of say, I do hope. I know, I, I understand the privacy from the family, and, and people shouldn't don't have a divine right to understand what's going on with Michael right now. But I do hope that on some level, he's got some awareness of what Mick's doing. Um, yeah. I think that'd be super sad if he doesn't. But yeah, you know. agreed, agreed. And I saw that, and uh, Mick coming into his own right now is just an amazing story. And I don't know who couldn't cheer for him. Uh, I have a question for you, Rob. Doing a little more research, and uh, this is dangerously close to a SAP stat, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it one because we haven't had a SAP stat. In a long time. <laughs> SAP stats. Here we go, Rob. So far in 2022, we've had 11 races. Do you know how many constructors have been on the podium? Four. What? That's correct. Oh. Can you? Can you, <laughs> can, you blew my mind there. Uh, can I you guess? I completely pulled that out of my backside. I... You know, for, for people who aren't watching this on video, which is just me and Rob, yes, that's the face he made. Uh, name? Can you name them now? That, that was the easy part. Was uh, the count? Now can Red you tell Bull, me? Ferrari, Mercedes. Yes. Yes. And now and... here's where it gets hard. Can you? There's only one other one. Uh, who else has been on the podium? Let's say Alpine. That's incorrect. It's McLaren. Oh, oh it was in Lando Italy. Get... It was Lando. Yeah, I, that, that was between those two. For some reason, I could see Fernando's beaming smile on the podium, but I've obviously made that up. Made it up. Well, not this year, at least. So, um, yeah, I just you know, it was, we we talk about parody a lot, and we love Austria had great following, and even Silverstone had great following. We've only had one non Ferrari, Red Bull, and Mercedes podium, and it was once. Uh, in the fourth race. So I just found that a little fascinating. And I'm not knocking it. I love the fact we've had four. But uh, I was shocked at how tightly coupled that was. A um, couple other notes uh, as we look at the week. One is I was really excited Keanu Reeves is going to host and develop his own F1 documentary series for Disney+. Plus. Sign me up. John Wick F1. <laughs> Does it get any better? I mean, I love John Wick. If he actually... Oh, man. Keanu Reeves. I, I can't even speak. Sign me up. I'll be watching. And then there were some videos of note, social media items of note this week. Um, A, if you haven't seen the Grill the Grid, episode three, where they do a higher or lower, um, and it's on a number of laps driven this year, you got to check it out. Or last year, sorry, number of laps driven 2021. It was, you got to check it out. The driver's logic, who did more laps. um, I thought it was brilliant and it was fun to watch. And the question I'd ask is if anyone caught Lando addressing Yuki as Yuki san. <laughs> Yuki san. Very nice. Um, it was so good. Check it out uh, for sure. Then there was a laughing challenge with Max and Sergio from Red Bull's channel. I think you could pass. Uh, but then Max and Sergio had a great discussion about F1, and they called it F1's biggest debates. It's from Lad Bible, and I've watched them a lot. I think they're from the UK. I'm not sure, Rob, but yep, yeah, I've watched them a lot on other things. And they have Max and Checo 
just agreeing and disagreeing on comments and talking about last year. There's bloopers at the end. Definitely worth checking it out if you're interested. So I would highly recommend the Max Verstappen, Sergio Perez argue over F1's biggest debates from Lad Bible. And the last one that caught our eye, caught both our eye independently before we head over to the build-up to our interview was a Lego stop motion of uh, Joe's crash at uh, Silverstone by, on Twitter, if you go to at Studios Volume, it is so good. I don't know how long it took them to do that. It is fantastic. The attention to detail to every aspect of that crash is phenomenal. And I, I, I'm a sucker for Lego stop go. So, um, there now, we I think I saw this one too. Is that the one where George, they actually show his car then pull up and he hops out and he runs over and the runs barrier? Across. Yeah. <laughs> and he points in and then gets people over. I saw that too. That was so good. Whomever did that nailed uh. it. Right, okay, so that's news and social out of the way. So um, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes building up to, like we say, the backstory of how the heck did we end up with Jacques Villeneuve. Um, Got to be honest, straight out of the gate and be super honest here, it's because Pit Lane Paul is an absolute rock star. Um, when the we best. first started, yeah, when we first started this pod, I may have told this story on an earlier episode, was that I knew obviously he worked there. And when me and Brian decided we were going to start this, I sent the first episode to him and said, be gentle. Um, but if you think we suck, let me know, because then I won't bother wasting my time. And he came back and said, I absolutely won't be gentle. You know me. If you're bleep, I'm going to tell you you're bleeping bleep. Um, and he didn't. <laughs> he came back and he enjoyed it. And he, he's been on a couple of uh, shows where we've interviewed him. And off the back of that, he teased that he might have other folk that he could get on the show. And he teased Jack's name probably back in about January. And myself and Brian were like, okay, but it's nice of him to say that, but it's never going to happen. And as it kept rolling, it would every now and again pop its head back up again, so much so that myself and Brian ended up buying uh, Jack books. Villeneuve's books. Yeah. We read books, real books with <laughs> real words. Books. Not people. many pictures either. I know. It was amazing. I didn't know they had that. It was like a video, but you read it. <laughs> and I actually thought the one that I bought, I had the paperback of Winning in Style, which is kind of his first year in F1. In fact, it doesn't even go on to the second. I think there's about three chapters that are kind of the first couple of races of the 97 one. Where it kind of ends and goes, oh, we'll see how this season goes. It's like, that's such a shame because that was actually the year you won it. But, <laughs> um, but at the, right at the beginning, it feels like he's trolling you because it basically says that he likes reading books, but he likes reading works of fiction because he doesn't understand why people would want to read books about other people. You're like, oh, is that a test? Do I stop reading now? But anyway, anyway, um, we and, read the book, we prepared, yeah. um, and then it went quiet again, didn't it, Brian? It was... Yeah, we, it went quiet, we didn't know what was happening, but Paul is a rock star. And so, Pit Lane Paul, this is, this is for you. Um, yeah, so we prepared, we had a whole set of notes, and we actually... So again, you know, the dirty side, everyone who listens, uh, I hope appreciates, it's, we're just two fans, and we're talking with other fans, and we're all dirty siders, you're fans of F1. And... Uh, we prepared, as though we're fans, because we're clearly not journalists. We've had a chance to interview a couple other people prior to this where we were a little nervous. But with books and with watching videos and preparing for a, an F1 world champion, we somehow wrote our own biography of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, we'd had we spent weeks going over this in meticulous detail. And Rob looks at it one day and says, Oi, all we've done is written our own book about Jacques Villeneuve here. We're about to interview him. This doesn't make sense. And so we had to pull back and kind of reassess. And uh, yeah, you'll hear those nerves throughout the interview, especially from Robert as we start. But it's yes. all in there and it's a glory because we wanted you guys to hear it. It was the coolest thing. And I cannot thank Paul enough for making it happen. And of course, Jacques Villeneuve for making the time to do it. You are... A, a rock star. You are a man amongst non-men. You are a champion of whatever. I don't know. You are handsome. Most people not so much. I don't know. Just tremendous. So, so Thank you. I, I'm a, although while Paul is a star, I'm going to blame my nerves on him a little bit because in the week building up to it was Silverstone. Because my brain's a blur. It was Silverstone this happened over, wasn't it? It was that weekend. Yeah, yes. And in the week running up to it, we got a text. This might happen Saturday. Okay, great. So now we panic and we're getting ready for Saturday. And then on in US time, my Saturday morning, it was just after Quali, I think it was, and uh, sent Paul a note. Is any idea when it might be happening? Yes, it might happen soon. Okay, when soon? Probably in the next five to ten minutes. And that was when <laughs> panic stations kicked in. I sprint down to the room where I record this stuff, sent Brian a text. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's happening. Uh, we got on. 
we saw Paul. Paul was kind of there to kind of be a chaperone and make sure that Jack didn't get himself in trouble and just listened into the interview. And then all of a sudden, a third window opened up on the Zoom. And there we were, uh, face to face with Jacques Villeneuve. And we're going to play the interview now. But what we're also going to hear is, um, I've left it in there. I said last week I could have edited my introduction out, but I haven't. Uh, my voice is all over the place. Uh, like, my voice is just broken. And... Um, <laughs> Well, while we prepared the first line we wanted to say, which you'll hear in a second, I deliver. After that, we knew the topics we wanted to discuss, but I'd never understood how you might start a conversation with a world champion. And you'll hear now, it's fair to say I still don't, um, because what I do know what to do is blabber like an idiot for about 35 seconds and then throw Brian under the bus. Yeah, well, thankfully I was there to uh, get run over, but it was awesome. So now enjoy the Dirty Side interview with Jacques Villeneuve. All right, we are incredibly lucky to have one of the 34 people ever to win the Formula One World Championship with us. I know that's hard to believe. Yeah, I'm. Um, when we started this podcast, Brian, I never thought I was going to say the sentence I'm about to say. So um, <clears throat> here goes. Welcome to the dirty side of the track, Jacques Villeneuve. <laughs> oh, hi, guys. <laughs> so one of 34, you said. I, I, I didn't even know it was just 34. Yeah, that's all there's ever been. 34 of you guys, and it's uh, we're extremely privileged to uh, have you make some time for us. So unfortunately, that probably means I need to give a shout out to Paul for uh, making it happen. But uh, we'll try and keep any kudos to Paul to a minimum. But um, yeah, so what we just wanted to do um, was just kind of really kind of go over... Uh, Highs and lows of your career, really, kind of uh, for new listeners and listeners out there that might know a little bit about you from the Formula One world, but not necessarily know what you did before it, what you've done after it, what you've done since. Just kind of have you talk us through um, basically all the, the best parts of uh, uh, of the career. So we don't want to turn this into a biography and walk through every step of your life and just have you validate it. We want to turn it into a bit more of a chat because we really aren't journalists yeah. and we don't know what we're doing. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, where do you want to jump in, Brian? Well, you know, Jacques, one of the questions I have, and, and I don't know if this is accurate, but winning the Indy 500, is it true you did two extra laps with that whole pace car situation? So are you technically the only winner of the Indy 505? Uh, yes, it's true. Um, two, two, two laps uh, just were taken out of my, my tally early in the race. So suddenly, instead of having done 50 laps, it went down to having done 48 laps. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, because when the safety car came out, uh, it was fueling time as well. And people had just gone in the pits. The team didn't realize I was in the lead. And we were, because we were running out of fuel, like most everyone. So they were stressed. And so we're still at speed. And when I got to the safety car, uh, it, it didn't show me to stop. So I just, at some point, the team said, oh, just go by it uh, until it picks the leader. So I went by it. Second time by, I slowed down a bit, and then we're chatting with the team. Said, well, "What happened? They didn't pick the leader up, and they didn't still realize I was in, in the lead." And the, the I think the pace car didn't really know who uh, the leader was either. So it's only by the third time I came behind it that someone put a hand out, say, "Hey, slow down." So, oh, okay, great, thanks. And then they opened the pits, and we just barely made it, but two laps were taken out. So that's incredible. I mean, like we, you know, watching motorsport on TV. And watching, you know, the board on the side of the TV screen and how many laps people, you know, what lap people are on, the timing. I find it incredible that you ended up running two extra laps in the Indy 500 and still won. That's, uh, did you, now yeah, after the race, did you find this out? And like, what went through your mind about it then? Oh, no, it, it was great because at that point I thought, I thought, okay, let's try and get a good results. Uh, we're looking after the championship, get some points for the championship. And by the end, I was running second on the last restart. And, think okay well i'll finish second again like the previous year it was already a good result with the penalty we had uh and at that point it was just a question of putting pressure psychological pressure on the on it was cut good year ahead of me uh before the restart so that he would make a mistake because he was quicker than me and i couldn't beat him on the track oh, amazing i mean that is like I, I love hearing stories like that by the way winning the indycar championship that year you are the fourth person. I love stats. I'm sorry. We do a thing on here called SAP stats. <laughs> so I love stats. So I, as in addition to the 34th, you're the fourth person to win both the IndyCar and F1 World Championships. Emerson, Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, Nigel Mansell, and you. So I just think that's an amazing group as well. And we'll, at the end, we're going to ask you a couple questions about you know, post F1. You, you, you seem Jim Clarkian in the way you can drive just about anything. I did not know that uh, until after Formula 1. 
Wow. Uh, because back then or even now, you, you know, you're, you're, you're made to believe that you can only drive one kind of car. Um, and, and you end up believing it as well, as well, because that's all you've been uh, driving. So it took me getting out of F1 and to try my hands uh, at other, other type of cars to find out that actually there's a way to adapt to every form of, of driving. But that also come, you know, when I was younger, I was doing some motocross, not racing for fun. I was ski racing, doing a lot of different sports that always teach you to find a way to adapt and use and, 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 and for you to use the, the medium you have, whether it's a car, a, a motorbike, skis, whatever, to find a way to make them go faster and to go faster uh, with a clock. Well, and I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. So do you have like an inherent sense of speed, of smoothness, of finding that right balance where you're getting the most performance while not, you know, whether it's in a turn, whether it's skiing, whatever, maybe not scrubbing off speed. How do you, like, what do you attribute that to? I don't know. I think uh, skiing helped a lot for that uh, because obviously you don't have an engine um, to, to get you out of trouble. And you, then you have to find ways to pick speed up or to create speed. Uh, and you have a, a real feel through your feet, your body on how you're sliding or sliding, catching the edge. And, and, and that I found very useful then in, in, in cars. Um, I always loved working the old fashioned way, engineer piece of paper. Now, closing my eyes and, and trying to feel the lap I was doing, the braking, the corners, uh, and, and why or what to do to go faster. And, and sometimes just numbers with arrow look better on paper, but if you can't drive it naturally, you'll actually be, be slower. Right. Uh, and, and there's a million reasons why you have understeer or oversteer. So just telling in here, I have understeer. It's not enough. <laughs> is, it, is it because... Uh, the front is a little bit too stiff and, and it reacts too quick to your steering input. So then you go beyond it and you create the understeer or is it because the rear sits down? There's a million reasons for every problem that can happen on the car. And the trick is to, to then to be able to feel and visualize what is physically happening with the different parts of the car, the damping, the springs, to try and understand. Then in, in your mind, when you talk with your engineer, you do a little change and you try to imagine what it would do your driving how the car would react and how you could drive around a problem and how it would affect the entrance middle or where the issue is would you actually be quicker like this and even if on the on, on paper this should be slower because it takes a little bit longer for the grip to arrive you can actually drive it better and you end up being quicker it's amazing to hear that from your side as well because last week or the week before we were lucky enough to speak to a guy that's um, an ex red bull performance engineer so he's done that other side of the conversation that you're talking about and he was saying exactly the same thing he said the driver that can come in and articulate to me where they feel they're losing speed and why is a million times more helpful to me than the guy that just says i've got understeer because i it, it's factually correct but it doesn't help me <laughs> it does, so yeah. well hey sometimes you even hear drivers come back in the pits and are so oh the car is shit. It's undrivable. That's not very helpful. <laughs> the engineer has no idea what to do with that. <laughs> so picking back up off the Indy 500 around that kind of time um, is when you made the, the, the leap over to, to Formula One. So a couple of questions here. How did the Williams thing come about? And was it an instant yes or that you just knew you needed to do it? Or did, was it something that took you a while to decide if it was the right time, right place to make the move? Oh, there, there was ne never any doubt in, in my mind. Um, I grew up in Europe, and the goal was F1. Uh, IndyCar came about once I'd started racing. Uh, when I was in Japan, and I started racing a little bit in America, that's when I started, and mostly when Nigel went over the, the pond. That, 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 made, that made it big. Uh, that was big news, and IndyCar was on the way up. It was, it was uh, huge, um, and it was amazing racing. I mean, the Indy 500 is the biggest race in the world. Uh, so... You know, to, to race there was, was very impressive. And it's that win uh, that then gave me the test uh, at Williams. Um, because I guess it showed uh, a, 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 an attitude, uh, not speed, because you can be fast on any kind of track, but that's a race with a huge amount of pressure. And then winning it, doing the two extra laps with all the extra pressure, I think, opened the eyes of Frank Williams and Patrick Ed and uh, Bernie Eccleston as well, who was uh, very active in, in, uh, in, in pushing for that test to happen. 
you obviously had an um, amazing career throughout all of motorsport, but in 96, right, you know, ch- challenging Damon Hill as an F1 rookie uh, was tremendous. And then 97, of course, your championship year. I-, I have to ask a question for you about 97, and in particular, the championship decider. This, it, I don't understand how one person could manage this. So in Quali, if I have this right, in Quali at, at, at Jerez in 97, you had the same time to the thousandths with Michael behind you, and then your teammate Heinz Harold Frensen behind that. And so you walk in one point down to the race. If I have my, and I could be wrong, but you walk in one point down to the race for the world championship, starting on pole with two people right behind you with the same times. How, how, how was it a normal day? Did you sleep at all the night before? <laughs> like what, how do you manage and then still have the focus to the point you just made about showing your medal in Indy? How do you do that? It's probably one of the nights I slept the best before a race. Uh, but, you, you know, it's, it's it's a little bit like Indy. You know, I had to come back from a penalty with two laps down. So you get to become the underdog and you have nothing to lose. And it was the same thing in Harris. I was one point behind. Uh, I had nothing to lose. At work, I would finish second or uh, I would win. It wasn't when you're in the lead, it's uh, you. Know, it's a little bit more difficult. It's not the same kind of, uh, of pressure. You can stress uh, about it. Uh, so, so it was great. Uh, the whole weekend just was with a very small amount of people. Just had dinner and didn't even talk about the race. So, <laughs> Normal dinner, bad, and uh, but the energy was crazy in the paddock. You could feel that it was a, uh, it, it was a, uh, it was not a normal day. And I need to ask when, when Michael turns in on you and you guys uh, make that contact after you leave that contact, is are you on? hyper alert now for any type of feedback in the steering wheel or anything is there was there ever a moment where you thought the car's done and you weren't going to be able to finish or did you know you'd come straight off that contact and you your your car was in good order i came off the contact and i could feel the, the steering was straight the car was in good order but the the, the the jolt had been quite strong and the cars weren't as solid back then as they are now so i was wondering if something had been fragilized um and you know you hit the brakes hard you hit curbs uh, there's a lot of things that go into the car that if something has been slightly damaged that you don't feel, it will break at some point. Uh, so I, at that point, I just started braking early and by not hitting the brakes, brakes like a hammer, just gradually going on them. Same thing, same thing on the steering, avoiding the curbs. I ended up slowing down, not by much, but a bit, just to make sure I would reach the end. And it's a good thing I did uh, because the, the, the battery holder, which was in the side pod, had been broken by the contact. And the battery was moving around, only held by the the, the electrical cables. No so way! Should have fallen off. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So you won the championship, the F1 World Championship, by with the battery <laughs> hanging off just by cables, just by the electrical cables. Uh yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is uh, which is uh, which is crazy. And had I not slowed down, it would have probably come off. Unbelievable. Honestly. And so. Um, you know, and I know we're kind of hopping around here, but it's just so fantastic getting these insights. When you're when you, when when that happens, when and Schumacher had done it what three years prior on Damon, right? I think in '94, if I remember right. When he does that to you, I mean, I watched the video a million times. You're clearly, and as you said, you're on the grass. You're kind of in the corner. Like, do you just think, what the hell is this guy doing? Or like, do you not even think about it and go, I just got to finish my race? Like, like how do you process that? I would have been furious. We were all expecting it. I was just surprised when I got next to him. The, the key to overtaking him was to surprise him so he wouldn't see it coming and to do a, a dive from quite far behind. So that's why he had a late reaction to it. Uh, but having seen it happen the years before, it was expected. Uh, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a surprise. So um, when we spoke to Paul... And he he kind of came on and took us through that amazing Braun GP year. And we kind of asked him, what was it like when you guys had won the title? And he says, I honestly can't tell you. He said, I know I celebrated like crazy, but my brain is just, whether it's total euphoria or whatever it is, I, I can't remember the moment we won the title. What about you? When you crossed that uh, checkered, uh, got the checkered flag and you're, you're world champion, do you remember... Is it all a blur all the way back to the pit lane? Did were you able to absorb and and enjoy the kind of the cool down lap? I mean, what happens from the moment that flag waves and you're now the world champion of F1? Oh, I was exuberant, <laughs> uh, but it's easy to remember because there, there's been so many pictures and videos that somehow it refreshes your memory, and you don't know if the memory is a real memory or because you've seen it on pictures, so your brain <laughs> just takes it as a memory. But um, it, it was great. I remember driving down the pit lane and 
and you know the mechanics even from other team were their fists like congratulations and huge grins and smiles it was it was a very euphoric moment uh, and then all the Renault uh, engine engineers uh, were, were wearing a, a yellow wig because I was <laughs> blonde at the time, which was which was also great. And then uh, both uh, Coulthard and Hackden putting me on their shoulders on the podium. That, that that was cool. I love watching that. I love watching that. So I don't know how they did it. <laughs> I, I I've only seen it when you're on their shoulders. I've watched yeah. it. I've, and you're up there celebrating. I and the blonde hair you <laughs> mentioned, the blonde hair, and you kind of had like a. Uh, I don't want to say baggier, but baggier fire suit, like a more comfortable fire suit. And your clothing was very um, hip and it was great. It was, I mean, you were one of the big reasons I love F1, just watching someone who felt like I could relate to, um, well, who was having you know, fun. It was good because I was al- always allowed to, to be myself and to not think too much ab- about that aspect. And, and it was accepted uh, for some reason. It, it, it's just the way it was. And then I guess what, when, when you win, you're kind of allowed to do whatever you want and you, you're allowed to be <laughs> to be yourself it's when you stop winning that uh, it doesn't work that well well I, one question I, I guess you know especially for our listeners we have a good mix Jacques of sort of new and um, long tenured fans of F1 and so the dirty siders kind of enjoy hearing a little bit of the inside aspect so when you're in F1 regardless of which season it may be when you were there, like, what are some of the things people don't appreciate? What are some of the things a fan watching from the outside doesn't know or doesn't appreciate of being an F1 driver? Like, are there a couple things that stand out to you that said, man, people really don't get this? Well, all that is seen is the jet set and race day, and it's fun and loads of fans. Uh, it's changed a bit because now drivers do simulator instead of testing, because we used to have testing in between every race. So the amount of of time and energy and work put by teams drivers mainly mechanics they, they, it's it's huge it's 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 so much more than than is uh, than is seen and and what's amazing is how tired you are, are at the end of the year just mentally exhausted now with the long season it drags on and on and it, it, it it's, it's tough but uh, that is not something that is seen it's easy to see the sunday the gla- glamour of the race and and the uh the excitement, uh, but I guess it's a little bit like like golfing. Also, for, for the drivers, is normally you'll have a lot of bad holes, and and it's very frustrating, and and you hate the game, and and then you'll have one good hit, like one good race, one good lap, and it reminds you why you love uh, the sport so much. You mentioned uh, that the the guys use the simulators these days. Now, in preparation for this, um, I actually read your winning in style book, right, and. In there, you talk about how you learnt some of the tracks uh, by playing video games, right? Now, this is mid nineties. Uh, I remember, like my Sega Mega Drive, the graphics were not fantastic. Although maybe the PlayStation had come out. What were you playing back then that was going to give you some insight to tracks? Well, it was Grand Prix by uh, Jeff Crawford, I think. What, what, what was it? Yeah, I think. Yeah, Grand Prix. Uh, the, the game Grand Prix. Yeah. Um, I think I was playing it on. Uh, well, it must have been on a PC. I, 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 well, yeah, I don't remember exactly now, but it was, it was mainly, it, it, they were quite accurate and for the time it was great. And it wasn't to, to learn how to drive. It was to have a memory of what corner was coming. Right. You know, after the hill, is it the left or right hander? So your brain already knows what to expect. That's it. So you do five or 10 laps in the game just to have a memory uh, and, and, and of the course. And then that's it. And then, then you learn actually learn to track on the track. So it wasn't full on preparation like they do now. Uh, but that was very useful for tracks like Spa, that I high, high speed and long track. Um, and and back then we didn't do the walk uh, with with engineers and the team. That's been a very modern thing around the track. But walking Spa, you don't have the speed, so you don't really remember what what's coming. So that that was the reason the reason for for doing that but i was always a gamer so it was it was easy it just gave me the excuse to play a little bit <laughs> and on in on, and talking to spa i mean there's two sections where you, you describe laps around circuits one is kind of monaco where actually makes it sound like really you didn't enjoy monaco that much not as much as probably everyone else watching in did um, but the one that you did that you could almost feel the kind of just the the raw excitement as you're describing it in the book is, is spa and lots of drivers say this. So is, is that in out of all of Formula One, it, would that rank as one of your favorite tracks to drive on? And if not, which one is? It, it depends on which car. Um, if you look at F1 now, uh, Orge is easy flat. It's not a corner anymore, but it's still dangerous, but it's not difficult to, to drive. 
uh, blanchiment is, is easy uh, and Pouin is it, it, I've seen it flat as well so it, it removes a little bit of the excitement of what Spa was so the, it depends and same thing happened with Suzuka which is the other great track and these are the kind of tracks where I was always somehow quick uh, always beat my teammates on those tracks uh, by, by margin uh, tracks like this are like Elkhart Lake or Road America in the, in the States um, and some tracks just come naturally to you. I, I guess that comes also from from skiing. They 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 they're more similar to downhill skiing than slalom, and and that's always what always what I preferred when when I was skiing. Uh, and they're tracks that gives you a feeling of going somewhere. There's a hill. There's a mountain. There, there there's some there's a reason for a corner. It's not just oh let's put the corner here so there's more corners. <laughs> uh, Monaco actually was amazing to drive. It's just a weekend that was hell. Uh, because you didn't have any space to to, to work, uh, you couldn't sleep at night because everyone was partying until six in the morning. So it it just made the weekend hectic outside of the car. Once you got in the car and driving in between the guardrails, it, that that was bliss. That that was that was crazy. When you were in one of the craziest races that I can remember, the '96 Monaco race, where I think three people actually crossed the finish line, um, and if I remember right, yeah, I think three or four. But, yeah, and then Badur, I think, hit you kind of into. It was I was reading about it six laps behind you, and somehow he was six laps down, and and took you out in a, in a in a crash. But what was that like? I mean, like, did did all the drivers look at each other afterwards and be like, "What just happened?" I mean, like, how do you end up having four cars? Yeah, well, that that Badur moment was frustrating. He was six laps down, and I was lapping him, and he just back then the blue flags weren't uh, as enforced as today, and he just turned in anyway. Didn't yeah. didn't pay attention, didn't care. Um, which I wasn't going to win the race with Damon in front, but then he blew up. So, uh, so it could have, have, have gone my way. Who knows? Uh, but it just things kept happening, and uh, I think Irvine took four car- cars off because uh, he spun. And w- when he, he decided to put himself straight on the track, was um, then he cars were coming and they just ran into him, or uh, it, it was just crazy. But that's how Monaco always used to be. Um, a lot of action, a lot of cars failing down, uh, drivers making mistakes, getting tired. Uh, it, that doesn't happen anymore. And, and talking about things happening, um, obviously the flip side of uh, great control of speed is is when you lose control. And and uh, you've had a few. I was Googling and looking at a few of the crashes, and I just wanted to know, okay, there's there's one thing being in control in the tight guardrails against Monaco, I guess, and the, and the, and the thrill of everything whizzing past you. When you... Oh, that split second when you now know you're out of control and you're 180 miles per hour. What the heck goes through your brain yeah. at that point? Well, the first thing is, well, you think, okay, this is going to hurt. But <laughs> you, you, well, that's just before you hit the wall. But the first thing you do is you try to find, to see, look in the mirrors, look around, see how how you're going to hit, if you're going to hit something, if you can spin and recover it. So you always look in your mirrors, try to get your bearings, your 3D space awareness to see if there's a way for you to salvage the situation. Um, the lap time is gone, but you might be able to salvage the situation, not crash, not damage the car. Uh, that doesn't last very long. And then when, when, when that is gone, you think, oh, this will be painful. And you just brace yourself. Because it looks to be that the ones that are most spectacular for TV are the ones where you end up going in sideways and maybe rubbing across barriers and debris goes everywhere, but they don't look as... I think the one in France, you went straight into a set of tires, like straight head on. There's no spinning, no debris. And I guess that's got to be the one that is the driver's nightmare because nothing else is taking the force of the car off, right? There's the spectacular ones look great, but they look less, says the man who's never driven a Formula One car. Uh, that, that's generally true, unless you take Grosjean uh, in, uh, in Bahrain. That one was, was painful. But generally, yeah, when you have pieces everywhere, something was absorbed uh, somewhere al- al- along the line. Um, and w- when you don't see par- uh, pieces and the car just stops dead, then, then the G force that the, the body takes is, uh, that, that's the one that's, uh, that's, uh, big, uh, F1 cars have become almost too solid now. Um, even the suspensions, because they bang sometimes walls with their suspensions and nothing breaks. And we've seen that in Miami this year where two cars hit a wall in the slow speed corner and actually they felt a big jolt and they weren't even going fast. Uh, so it looks like not a lot of absorption happens. You know, one of the questions I have, I guess, uh, last one on the crash. Hey, hold on a second. The, yeah, go ahead. The key also, when you crash, the, the, the key to get as little hurt as possible is to have a good seat, to spend time in the factory making sure that the seat is holding you properly 
all around the ribs, all around just not, not something that's flimsy. Uh, and, and same thing where your knees go, where your feet go. Uh, that's why in 96, when I got there, we put some some uh, flags on the sides of the pedals to hold the feet in place. And same thing with the heels. And now everybody's got them. Um, and, and little pads on the side of the cars because, and sometimes, you know, some mechanics will get upset because you, it becomes annoying after two days of that, of just changing a little bit of this and that just to make the car safer. And they think, oh, you're scared. And no, because ultimately you break a finger, you will miss a month of racing also. So it's not just because of the damage. So there's a good reason to do that. And the chances of you getting hurt are le- hurt are less as well. You know, I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that the way that the seat is set up can help with that. That's uh, amazing. Um, I hate to ask this question, but I'm going to do it anyway. Across all of your time racing, and across all of the different cars you've raced, what's your what is your most painful or worst crash where you look back and say, "God, that was a nasty one." Um, hmm, I don't know because I, I, I the first one I had an Indy car. Uh, I, I cut another car in half in Phoenix on the old. That that one was painful. Um, wow, I've had a few painful ones. The, the one that hurt that hurt for a while was uh, I had the wall in Michigan. The suspension failed and went straight into the wall that. Uh, at uh, 230 miles an hour uh, and it wasn't a soft wall back then uh, and to get me out of the car they had to cut the monocoque because the the where the shoulder is the monocoque had opened up and the race got then got stuck in, in the carbon fiber of the car when it closed back so that, that and, and that then my shoulder was painful as well uh, at that oh. point um the crash in australia at bar that then one that one uh, that, that 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 one yeah I, I thought i was i was gone on that one Ooh. Talking to BAR, so um, that was, it gets written as um, this is kind of uh, you trying to take a new team and, and, and take it to the top. Um, was that your um, uh, outlook going in and, and kind of how do you look back at that BAR uh, period? Because, you know, you, you just come off as uh, being a world champion um, and here you are now at a brand new car. And I think there was maybe lots of expectations, lots of buzz. Um kind of talk us through that kind of moving from Williams to the BAR and, and, and how that went. Well, Williams wasn't keeping me after 98 anyway. So a lot of people ask me, oh, why did you leave Williams? Well, there, there was not a seat available there. Uh, that wasn't Williams way to keep their champions uh, anyway. Um, and it started with Craig's idea of building a team. And I thought it was amazing. So uh, at that point, I put all the money I had earned into it and, you know, I, 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 I was a, a third of the team was mine, basically. So it was my team that I built. A lot of people say, oh, you, you just went and drove there for the money. And actually, I put my money in there and I built that team uh, w- with Greg. So uh, and that team today is Mercedes. So it wasn't uh, yeah. still the same factory. There's still some people that we put in place there that, that are working there. And it's been extremely successful. So it wasn't a, a bad a bad plan. And if you look at the first season, the car was breaking down a lot, but we often qualified the front, finished eighth when the car wasn't breaking down, and we were destroyed and blasted, and 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 people were 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 say we were embarrassing. But when someone finishes top ten now, they're applauded. They're like, "Oh wow, yeah. you're so amazing!" So <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> the perception how 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 we were destroyed compared to how we would be perceived uh, today uh, in in the same uh, situation. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're right. When the when the car worked, it was good, and and I th- and a lot of people always talk about how the the main thing around F1 is that reliability. And I guess that's the thing you can't just have a magic bullet for and tell the engineers and the people at the factory go make it reliable. It's just not that easy yeah. to do, right? There were a lot of issues with, with that car. Renault had stopped being an official manufacturer, um, and the engine that carried on was vibrated a lot, uh, and the car was fat, fragile, and and the vibrations kept breaking parts on the car. Uh, lost a rear wing, suspension were failing. It, it was it, it, it was crazy, uh, but the car was quick. It was difficult to drive. Uh, it was sliding a lot, but it was neutral, so it suited my way of driving. Uh, I could slide it around, and 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 with that, we managed to do some some good good races in Barcelona, Imola, Imola uh, Australia, where you know top six. Uh, but then the car was breaking down, Man. and back then only top six were scoring points. True. So. Yep. You know, just looking at, at, at an amazing career as you left F1, you've run in so many other cars and so many other series. What's been your favorite thing that you've done since F1? Because, uh, you know, watching this year, you qualifying and then running in Daytona was amazing. So I'm just curious, like, where have you 
found the most fun over the over the last you know handful of years? Well, I've had the blast in NASCAR. Um, yeah. The racing is fun uh, when you're in a pack. Uh, Daytona is one thing, but road racing. When I was doing the races in Montreal or Elkhart Lake, um, you're you're always leaning on each other. You know, uh, it's it's different than than Europe. It's it's not that you'll get a penalty. You do something, someone, then that someone will do it back to you. Like the way it used to be in, in racing, that builds respect. Uh, and and the racing itself, qualifying is okay because the cars aren't as fast as F1, obviously. But it's the racing, 40 cars on the track, uh, all in a big group. It's, it's like a river flowing around the track, and you just have to find your way. Uh, and I found that um, amazing. Uh, it's been exciting. Um, other form of racing, I thought ice racing was quite uh, <laughs> was quite cool. When you arrive in the corner and you're already backwards 30 meters <laughs> before the corner, and you accelerate to slow down or to break it, and, and you have wipers on the side window. It's, it's really, really different. <laughs> Do you really have wipers on the side window? So as you're going sideways, you can see yeah, that on the, direction? On the ice racing, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's only in France it's like this, yes, because the rear wheels are also steering. So uh, you steer yourself uh, before the corners. It's, it's really a weird, uh, but it, 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 was, it was a lot of fun uh, the, the, those, uh, those years. Amazing. Um, you know, recognizing we, we want to keep the time uh, tight. I, one thing I would like to know, kind of the last topic we have is current F1. When you look at F1 today, 2022, and you look at whether it's the new regulations for closer following or whether it's, you know, the, the, the kind of way the sport is turning into a business, which is fine, but, you know, it is. I guess I'd, I'd love your thoughts uh, or a thought on what is the one thing you would change in today's F1 that, you know, you, you, you think could be better? What's the one thing that kind of, you know, you look at as a, as a world champion and say, boy, that would be better, better if it were this? Huh. Um, well, I don't know. The cars are a little bit too heavy, uh, basically. Um, and I would, I would open, I would open the tire manufacturers. Oh, really? Like you said, de- definitely. So that there's a, a proper battle, um, and a push. Um, what else? You, it, it's, I, I, I love the sprint, the sprint race weekends. Okay. It doesn't give a better Saturday, but it gives a better Friday. So overall it gives a better three days. Um, which is good. Mostly when you have rainy days, like Friday, not a lot of driving happened. With the sprint race weekend, like Imola or, or wherever you are, then there's a lot uh, happening thanks to the, the sprint race. So I think that that's not a, uh, it's quite a good way. And it's good when weekends are different. You know, you could have some longer races, some shorter, but it's just that it changes. It's not that it's the same every weekend, weekend in and, uh, and weekend out, um, basically. All right. And well, go back to testing. Remove, removal, remove uh, the simulators and go back to testing. But it's good for the fans to see the cars while they're testing. Nobody yeah. goes and watch a, a simulator, and it's as expensive anyway. And not every, not every driver can use a simulator. I, I, I know it's, I, it would be very difficult for me. I've tried a, I've tried a, a home simulator with the, the, the mask and, and all that. I think I did three braking zones before I was ready to puke. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, it, and I understood why. It's because... With the driving, when you brake, and it's visually all realistic, you, your brain expects negative G-force. You're in the simulator, you hit the brakes, everything er- happens as if you should receive negative G-force, and you don't. And that's what makes you sick. Right. Like oh, being uh, in a very awful roller coaster. or you know, the, <laughs> And, and that, that's not something uh, um, and, uh, that I, can, I could cope with. But if you don't have that inner ear thing, I guess it's better for the simulator, but worth worse for the the real racing. And after speaking with some engineers, a lot have been telling me that you can make a very good simulator race uh, driver, but if he becomes super good on the simulator, normally he loses a little bit on on the real driving as well. There is a small difference, so um, you you also have to be careful uh, with with all with all that. Um, I would also remove the park for me. Now you have okay. a budget cap anyway, so why have a pack for me? There's no, there's yeah, no let them make changes throughout the weekend if they need yeah, to. They have the budget to spend all yeah. year, so just just do it. And we need some proper regulations on what the penalty is for going beyond the budget cap because right now it's they can do a million things, but who knows what will actually be the penalty taken out of the box. Right. I, I mean, everyone keeps saying all these different teams are getting close to their caps, and then different teams start arguing they need to raise the cap, but 
if you said at the beginning of the year and teams shouldn't be penalized for hitting it, the ones who can't hit it should be penalized. And like you said, know how much what is the penalty? I, I, it's as if they've decided from the start that they would go past it anyway and then right. argue. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> but also I mean, because there is no clear penalty. It could be a financial penalty. Then who cares? Right. It could be a few points. Okay. But it could also it could also be exclusion from the championship. But which one will it be? Who, who knows? I, it's it's hard to imagine. It's it's hard to imagine the decision of excluding a team if they've gone beyond one million, ten million. How how does it work? I, I think the, the the best penalty would be if you overspend by one million, you have to give one million to every other team in the grid, and they're allowed to spend that million even if it goes beyond their cap and so on. So if the top teams all spent ten millions more, they, they would be spending. Hundred, uh, yeah, ten, ten, hundred millions more, and right. all the the smaller teams would get all that money. Then, then, okay, that would balance it out. That would be fun. That would be fair. I like that kind of like a luxury tax uh, uh, that you see in some sports, but then shared with the other teams. That would yeah, be... and it's your decision for having overspent. Right. So then your own your own culprit. Well, we have. Um, sorry, Rob. I didn't mean to cut you off. We were no, running I, out I of just, time. I, yeah, I was going to say. I'm looking at the clock, and and I know, and we could we could be considerably <laughs> more uh, greedy and keep going, but we know we have to be respectful of your time, and it's been absolutely amazing uh, to have you on. I, I still can't believe this is actually happening. Uh, maybe a bit like you said about watching the TV pictures of your championship, it'll help refresh the memory that this really did happen. Uh, so, for us, yeah. For us. I just but, want to say thank you so much for coming on. It's been amazing. No, thank you. This was fun. It isn't always this was fun. <laughs> well, well, actually, uh, could we? Uh, are we going to do the one hundred seconds, Rob? Uh, I, I think we're coming up. We're coming up to thirty-five minutes okay, now, okay. so I think right. we're pretty much capped we, out. We, we will need to sign let... off, Jacques. Thank you so very much. This is like mind blowing, and the time you shared with us, the insights to things that we wouldn't appreciate, and I think the listeners will appreciate hearing some of those things. Just tremendous, and uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for the time and the generosity of of sharing your opinions with us. Uh, thank you and have fun. We are still buzzing from that. And I walked away with so much and I was kind of teasing this on Twitter. Holy cow, the championship decider, 97. The battery is loose after Schumacher hits him and they find it and it's just hanging on by the leads. And had it come out, he, he doesn't win the he doesn't win the race, he doesn't finish the race, he doesn't win the championship. What? Like what? <laughs> And, and like the, I still don't understand this, right? So he qualifies with the exact same time as Schumacher behind him to the thousandths, and we'll get into that a tiny bit more in some sap stats here in a second. And then Heinz Harold Frentz and his teammate at Williams, and he just sleeps fine. Uh, yeah, that whole it was the best night's sleep I've had. I was huh? I was like, what? What? I mean, there the, were. I mean, the I googled the battery story afterwards because I'd never heard that, and. I think the press and everybody got. I did find it. You know, he has done. Obviously, this isn't. Unfortunately, this isn't a dirty side exclusive. Uh, I did find <laughs> it on a couple of other interviews that he's done. But it's not a not a question that he gets asked a lot. I think he gets asked a lot more about the crash and the attempted you know, takeout by Schumacher, and then the the after bit. Oh, and by the way, you then got home and won the title. I don't think people asked him about it so much. So I think it was quite cool hearing his. Uh, you know, I'm lifting off, I'm slowing down, I'm hoping that nothing's broken. Um, that was that was super cool. What was also super cool and why we kind of included it on the artwork was why anybody might be wondering why on earth there was a skier in the middle of the uh, in the, the artwork that we did for this was because that whole thing about his appreciation for speed coming from skiing, um, I thought that was pretty cool as well. Amazing. Like, and, you know, as I kind of mentioned in there, you know, Nicky Lauda would always talk about his ability to feel the car and Jim Clark could drive anything. Uh, Fangio was a mechanic, um, you know, speaking about some of these all-time greats. Hearing Jacques talk about the skiing aspect and his appreciation for building, maintaining, and, and kind of keeping speed through corners and turns, that smoothness, oh, tremendous. And then seat, the seat thing, how, I didn't know, I, I mean, to me, I always hear about the seat fitting. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, because it's a small car and, you know, they make the little thing so your butt's off, tiny bit off the of the, the chassis and you know you're tight in there and it holds you in oh my god i had no appreciation for how important that seat is and what it can actually do and, and help save you in the, some of those situations i i just didn't i didn't think of that did you 
No, no. And I mean, the other thing, and I hope it came across in the audio because we had the visual aspect to it, but when he rubbed the bridge of his nose and kind of was almost going back to that moment where he told us about the crash when he thought he was almost done for, um, you can kind of see that that memory is still pretty, like, super real because his face, I mean, it was kind of like, uh, oh, man. But I thought it was cool to get inside the uh, what happens during a crash. That, yeah. that was really, I liked that part as well, so. Yeah. I mean, it was just, we, we could go on and we could repeat the entire 35 minutes, to be honest, because we, we know we, we ran out of time. Um, we'd have loved to have done the DRS, but he he told us we could probably have about half an hour. He was going to dinner and we managed to get 35 from him. So again, thank you very much, Jack, for coming on and thank doing you. it. It was just, uh, so cool. it's just amazing. I've, uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever been starstruck in my life before, but that was insane. Well, now... We're throwing down the gauntlet to any other F1 world champions who want to try their hand at being with the dirty side. Come check it out. Or current drivers or former drivers. You know, you're always welcome. A- here any major side. celebrity now, because we've got it down. We will be totally cool next time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> For sure, no. But we do have some stats to close out. I, I did. I, you should be proud of me, dirty siders. I held back on doing too many stats, obviously. Well, well I, hang on, hang on. Before you move into this, so myself yeah. and Brian had this conversation. Brian wanted to hit Jack with a whole bunch of SAP stats in the episode, in the interview. And I was yeah, like, when we were doing the biographical you, research, you, I was all wanna, ready to go. You want to burn like this small amount of time. You want to just go through a whole bunch of, you won X number of races. You want to tell him all the things that he knows he probably achieved. Let's, let's, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on second thought, it was a good idea to take it out, but at first thought, but you can it was do a good it now, idea Brian, it. because your research is not wasted. All right. Well, here we go. Sap stats, 1997 F1 World Champion Jacques Villeneuve interview edition. All right. So some things that I thought were amazing. I obviously already mentioned the 34th person to ever win the F1 World Championship. Some which of he didn't are... know. Which I love the fact we look, we taught him something. No, I did. Sap stats. Okay, you not, did. Not Rob stats. Uh, and so, <laughs> anyway. You know this whole episode is going down as a veil's tale. Who yeah, have you interviewed fine. on Sap stats? Yeah, come me, on. Me, me, myself, and I. <laughs> so Jacques was the fourth man to ever take pole in their debut F1 race, uh, Australia 96. So Andretti, Carlos Reiterman, Jacques Villeneuve. But then some people only say three. The fourth was, of course, Farina in 1950 in the first ever F1 race. So someone had to take pole in the first ever race. So some people will say three. The answer is actually four. Um, The qualifying we mentioned, the 91 title decider, I'd seen it out of context. I'd seen that happen before on F1 videos, and I'd always forgotten that was at Jerez for the 97 championship. But as I would mentioned, the time was 1 minute, 21 seconds, .072. So to the thousandths, Jacques had it first, Michael Schumacher second, Heinz Harold Frentzen, as I mentioned, third. So that was the grid order. Um, he's the fourth person to ever win both IndyCar and F1 World Championships. I mentioned that, Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, Nigel Mansell. Uh, he was in F1 for 10 years, had 11 wins, 23 podiums, 13 poles, and a driver's championship in 97. We talked a little bit, and I love this stat, and I love his story about the Indy 500, uh, but he's the only person to ever win the Indy 505. And uh, the last one... This is the mind-bending one for you. At the end of the 97 season, the point difference between Jacques and Michael was three points. Jacques obviously won. But they never shared a podium over the 17 races. How does that happen? The two people who are neck and neck for the championship never shared a podium that season. So anyway, I thought that was fascinating. And those that are my a good stats. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that was a big sap stat to finish on there, Brian. Martin. I prepared. It's, I, that's why I wanted to read them to the man until you said, hang on a second, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> write, write him a letter. You can become pen pals. Yeah, yeah, I can do that too. If I'm reading books now, I might as well be writing stuff too, apparently. <laughs> All right. right. Okay, Closing sorry. the door on our highlight uh, of that amazing interview. Next week is a race. Back to Rowie Keek. Here we go with a French... GP at Circuit Paul Ricard. Rob, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about it because if I'm being completely honest, it's like one of my least favorite circuits. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 this I, is the opinion part of the of the episode. I don't like it. I um, I don't know why, and this is, it could be just something that's lodged in my brain, but for some reason, I always thought Mangy Core was a better uh, track. Now, it might not have been, but... I've never enjoyed this one either, so we, maybe we're both going to get uh, a, a pleasant surprise. So this weekend, they will run 53 laps of our favorite track, 
Uh, <laughs> and it is, by the way, we mentioned tracks for next year. I, I believe they don't have a contract yet for next year. It's one of the five or so races on this year that don't have a contract for 23. And I'm not crying for Circuit Paul Ricard, if I'm being totally honest. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's just a- concrete. It's just a big... They went to somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the south of France and near an airport. And they concreted over a bunch of land. And then they made a track out of the concrete. And then they took the rest of the concrete and painted the French flag colors as stripes around it so that every time you watch it, you want to vomit as the cam- cameras pan left and right. And maybe that's my own uh, cones and rods not working in my eyeballs. But the stripes, my God, who thought that was a good move? It's kind of like when you see one of those news anchors wearing a striped shirt and the camera kind of gets all fuzzy and doesn't know what to do with the stripes. It's kind of, no, I'm with you on this one. You do get some kind of stripe issues, but it's been on the calendar since 1971, but not uh, frequently. Um, I think it's 17 races that we've had there, right? Since, yep. And there's a lot more than 17 years since 1971. So, <laughs> Look at uh, you with the that. math. Look at me with the math, yeah. Ooh, that's number one. Um, okay, let's uh, some stats there, uh, like yeah. you've done on previous ones. Do you want to go through this? Yeah, this I'll is just close area, it. Right? I'll close it quickly uh, on the stats about Paul Ricard. So, um, eleven times that drivers won from from first, two times from second, two times from fourth, and two times from fifth. So, no third place pole, uh, no third place grid sitter has ever won the GP there. Um, and the most wins ever at four, fittingly, is Alan Prost. So it's kind of cool. I love when a countryman wins in their place. I mean, I love, I love that. So uh, bang on for there. Uh, Nigel and Lewis have two. Uh, the most other than that is, is one wins, and the only other current driver with a win there is Max. So there you go, Paul Ricard. I'm excited racing's back, and I'll be watching glued to the TV uh, with my barf bag as they pan around those stripes. Yeah, I mean, other than the stripes, every circuit that I've not loved as much so far this year has actually been better with the new cars. Yes. So I was down on Austria. I was saying how, oh, you know, last year we had to go and suffer twice in a row because it was such a poor race. Great and then race. boom, boom, amazing race this year. So who knows? Other than the stripes, then maybe this one can serve up uh, a good race. I'll be just be glad to have it back because it's, uh, although it's great to have an empty week so we could uh, slot the interview in, um, nothing like watching the cars go around, right? So, nope, nothing. Excited to have them back and we're excited you guys are listening and part of the dirty side family check us out every sunday obviously as we have race reviews great veils tales and other stories we are all about celebrating formula one and the love and the respect of formula one itself and we love having you guys as part of the dirty side so i for me i would just say thanks for listening thanks for listening this week and we look forward to talking to you again next week rob close us out my friend Yeah, I would just again echo that. Thanks for listening. Uh, We are slowly but steadily ticking upwards, which makes us our brains hurt. So if you enjoyed this one, then please share it. We don't want our interview with Jacques to be also our greatest secret never to be told. So uh, (laughs) spread the love, get it out there, help the dirty side grow and be part of it. And uh, we will catch you next week. Well, not from France because we won't be there, but it will be our French review. So um, until then, guys. (laughs) 